So I thought I'd give you a nice controversial title because it looks like it's a contradiction, right? The weakness of God. How could that ever be in one sentence? There's nothing weak about God, is there? Say, no. Well, then why did you put it in the title? Because I'm just quoting a scripture for you. And we're going to try to untangle that and unpack it a little bit. And it's, again, it's the brilliance of the Apostle Paul in this particular case because he wrote 1 Corinthians. And I would say, you know, you could probably make an analogy to the Corinthian church to the American culture today. It was a very secular culture. They were thriving. It was a big city. It was a port city. A lot of money and many people passing through. And whenever that happens, there's always an opportunity for lots of sin. Yeah. So the people that were getting saved were still pretty worldly. And Paul had to, had to really discipline them and work with them. And sometimes you could feel the frustration when you're reading his letters to them. The scholars that I've studied believe there was a total of four letters that he wrote, but only two of them found their way into the Bible. So there was one before this one that this verse is taken from when he said, the weakness of God is stronger than men. So I'll read you that verse in context uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.23. It says, we preach Christ crucified. Okay, now that's something I really want you to keep in your mind because when you preach Christ crucified, you're talking about the cross. And the cross doesn't make a lot of sense to people in the world. They interpret the cross as weakness. Because you're holding this guy up as some savior, but how come if he was such a savior, why would he get taken by the Roman army and crucified? That's a very uh, in, uh, horrible way to die. He was tortured to death. So if he was such a great king, then how could you put your trust in this man? It's because that didn't end the story, did it? The cross is the first part, but it's the death, burial, and the resurrection that Paul says... If in this life alone you have hope, how miserable you would be of all the people in the earth. It's because of the resurrection that the cross is so powerful. And in the time that I have, I'm going to try to make that connection for you too. And we, we have this amazing big cross on the back wall. It's a shame you don't see it, but we couldn't do it with the uh, stained glass here. But that's Jesus with the woman at the well, in case you're wondering, to remind us that God wants us out in the culture talking to the unbelievers I believe he gave her a prophetic word, right? When he spoke to her, the Lord gave him a word to speak to her that caused her heart to open up. And why wouldn't he want to do the same with us? So we want to just dig into the cross a little bit because it feels like foolishness to the world. But to those who are saved, it's the key thing that we need to remember is the cross. All right, so we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, anybody here in that category? Those who are called, come on, you got to make a little more noise. Thank you. Those who are called, that would be us, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So how do we reconcile the foolishness of the cross with the power of God and the wisdom of God? Well, that's what we're going to look at. And, and it says the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. All right. So at least you see I'm not misquoting the Bible here for you. And let's just see where we go, how, how it takes us. So for me, and I'm sure you uh, would look at the culture right now, and in my lifetime at least, I would say it's never been more true than what we know is in Isaiah 520. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, right? So we would say through a biblical lens that the culture is upside down. They're calling good things evil and evil things good. Well, we're here for a reason, church. We're here to to see a shift in that. But in order to make a case for Jesus, you've got to meet people, meet them where they're at, show them respect, and try to speak to them and ask the Lord, what's the way to speak to them in a way that they can understand this good news that I have? And the cross initially looks like weakness until you get to the resurrection. Because you can't really change by fixing something that's so broken, which is the sinful behavior patterns in our life. We teach here that he wants us to crucify those things, and then he resurrects the new man on the other side of that cross, so that old thing has passed away and become new in Christ. So the idea that we, we will have a resurrected body someday, that's true, but I believe this is also for us right now. In fact, he said, pick up your cross daily. He didn't say pick up his cross, he said pick up your cross daily. Oh, so there's a lesson in there. And boy, I don't think there's ever been a time in my life that it's more evident why the world needs the message of the gospel. 
than now. So if not us, who? Right? Like, this is what we're here for. I don't like the results of the election, but I'm not quitting. I'm still going to talk about the power of God to change people's lives. Nobody else could change my life but the Lord. So I'm not going to stop telling that story because it's true. And another verse that you could look at to try to describe today's culture and, and the direction we're heading, in my opinion, is from Romans 1. It's a much bigger, you know, continuous thought, so I'm only pulling out a little bit of it here. But it says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So at the real root of this is idolatry. And I've said Psalm 2 so many times from the pulpit here, right? Psalm 2 is basically the world saying, get off my back, God, and stop telling me how I'm supposed to live my life. Why did the heathen rage? And Peter quotes that in the book of Acts when he's been put on trial. And he says, surely, Lord, this is what you were talking about, that they're trying to set a plan against the Lord and his anointed one, but we're not going to stop talking. <laughs> That's the same Peter that denied Jesus in the New Testament, full of the Spirit, says, okay, you officials, you decide whether it's right for, for us to listen to you or to God. We've already made our decision. We're listening to God. So you do whatever you have to do. That's conviction, isn't it? And that's what we all need to have today. And look, I don't really think that studying 14 hours a day necessarily, that's not a bad thing, but you know, you could... You could dive so deep into the details of all the social issues that you're not reading your Bible because you're so busy trying to keep up with this. And it's not by might or power. Yes, be informed. Don't give an, an opinion, a, a real strong opinion about something you haven't done a lot of homework on. But understand the basic truth is that, right, God, we believe that pro-life is the biblical standard, that for, as soon as those first two cells are conceived in the womb, that life begins right then. It's not about a heartbeat or any of that. It's that we're created in the image of God, and we're going to fight to try to protect that regardless of what the culture thinks. So they worship the creature rather than the creator certainly fits on that topic, right? Because one of the things the world would say, get off my back, God, is God is saying that if you want to live a, a really prosperous life, put boundaries around your sexual behavior. Make a commitment to one person, then you're ready to commit with that person for the rest of your life. You're not signing a contract. You're making a covenant commitment. And you're standing not on a stage, on an altar. It's a sacred, holy thing, matrimony. Joining together two things that were separate now become one. And Paul says, don't you understand that when you join yourself to a prostitute, your spirit became one with that person? And that when you leave them, you're leaving a part of you behind. And that fractures our spirit, man, and fractures our personality, and it, and it breaks the confidence that we have in ourselves because we feel defiled when we get into that sinful lifestyle. And people just say, you know what, I'm so far gone now, why bother trying? Somebody said, uh, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Think about that. Talk about counterfeit affections. My life is so miserable that the only way I can get by is to drink because if I don't drink, I'm going to need a brain surgery because that's how messed up my life is. That's so classic of what the world does. That's what working for the devil is like. You end up in a mess. So we're saying, no, look, you really should. You're going to prosper if you just put boundaries around your sexual behavior. Nobody in America wants to hear that right now. I'm, I'm a free bird, and I can do what I want. And if we're two consenting adults, we can do whatever we want. And it's true, you can. The thing is, should you? And what is it doing for our culture? It's destroying the culture and destroying the nuclear family. So we're going to just take that stand for, for biblical logic. It's, it's been what the church has been teaching for 2,000 years. It didn't just all of a sudden become okay. Marriage, man and a woman, Okay. Not confused about which is which. We know which one's a boy. We know which one's a girl. Yeah, I, I'm, it's another day, but this is the cross, okay? That's what I'm saying. You've got to say the key to a secular community is understanding the cross. And that's what this commentator said. He said in 1 Corinthians, Paul urges his readers that when living in a pagan world, how many live in a pagan world? I'll wait until you raise your hand. If you want me to go faster, wave at me, okay? 
<laughs> if you're living in a pagan world, they should see everything through the lens of the cross. It takes a continuous effort for us to think our way back into the life in Corinth, but not really, because we live on the East Coast near New York City. It's not that hard to think of a secular culture, right? I mean, before the pandemic, I was in New York every week, and there are certain parts of New York you can feel the sin in the atmosphere when you're walking through certain neighborhoods. There's a stronghold over that region. Not too big for God. That's what we're here for, to cause a shift, right? And then he says, these letters to the Corinthians provide endless insight into the challenge of living the Christian life in a pagan world. So I would say that's informative for us. And we started in verses 23 and 24, but I just want to go back in that same chapter. And, and Paul said, for this message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, come on, it is the power of God. The cross is the power of God. Because you don't just get to come in and take a decaffeinated version of Christianity. <laughs> it's the full bore or nothing, right? You can't have a, a, a watered down version of the gospel. You're either all in or you're not in, right? I've got to give my life to him. Now look, everybody's at a different place of growth. We all start on the milk and hopefully we transfer over to the meat at some time and we become mature. He's not looking for perfect people, but he's looking for men and women that are after his heart. That's what he honored David for, right? Not, he clearly wasn't perfect, but he was after God's heart. And that's always been our goal, to help you pursue God in whatever we feel. And you, you know, tell us and what we can notice about you and pray. And the Lord speaks to us that this is where you'll flourish. That would be a great, a great gift to give anybody is to help them know what God's calling is on their life. And then to help them flourish in that calling. All right? Those of us being saved, the cross is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will thwart the cleverness of the intelligent. That's a quote from Isaiah 29, 14. And then Paul just asks this rhetorically, where is the wise man? <laughs> we can think about that today too. It just depends on which station or which website you want to go to. Everybody's claiming that they have the answer. And you can basically find a, a validation of any opinion you want. And that might be new to this culture, but I've been in economics since I was in college in the 80s. And there was also always an economist that could tell you whatever you already wanted to hear. And I told you a couple weeks ago, there's something called confirmation bias that you really have to watch out for because it's this tendency that we only go to the things that we already believe and we look for people to validate that, but we don't give a really clear picture to the other options. And obviously not, the option has to line up with the word. But the, the only way you can, I feel, the only way you can be respectful to the other person is at least understand what they believe and why God's opinion is stronger than theirs. Always going to be stronger. So he says, where is the wise man? Where is the expert in the Mosaic law? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made the wisdom of the world foolish? <laughs> yes. For since in wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God... God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of preaching. Wow. Yeah, that's a big mouthful, isn't it? So look, we understand that the world's going to have a little hard time understanding that a crucified Jesus is a powerful God because they don't understand the redemptive side of resurrection. They just see Jesus up on the cross. But each one of us has to understand the cross because there's no resurrection in our lives unless we first go through some crucifixion. <laughs> You can't take that shortcut, right? And that's why being in the body of believers is so helpful because we can live out the Christian life together and, and we can be iron that sharpens iron and we can help and strengthen one another. So just go a little bit further in this 1 Corinthians to chapter 15 because this is where he talks more about the resurrection side. Uh, again, I, I already quoted it. If in this life alone you have hope, how miserable you will be of all the people in the earth, right? If Christ didn't rise, then you're not going to rise again. But we have the promise of a resurrection, physical resurrection someday, amen? Act like you're Christians. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. First, first Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you, first of all, that, I all, that which I also received, that Christ died, and then I just put this in in my own parentheses, is that weakness? That Christ died? for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again 
the third day, according to the scripture. See, you can't just say the cross without the burial and the resurrection. Because he came as the second Adam. The first Adam came, this is really spelled out beautifully in this chapter 15, and Jesus was the second Adam. So the first Adam sinned, Jesus lived a perfect life, did not sin. When he rose again, that was the perfect sacrifice that he could bring his blood to the mercy seat in heaven. And that, that could purchase our redemption, regardless of the sin that we've had in our lives. He's the only way that we have any substitute for the punishment that we deserve, right? He took it on himself. So it's not weak. He, he went to the cross voluntarily. Do you remember what he said to Pilate? You would have no power over me at all, right? Pilate was threatening him. You don't know who you're talking to, Pilate. You're not taking my life. I'm giving my life for my assignment from my Father. And then once Jesus put his blood on, on the mercy seat in heaven, Holy Spirit gets released. And now we have the very nature of God living on the inside of us. He's just not rude. He waits until we invite him to work with us our lives to work with him in our lives. We have to acknowledge him. That's why that song is so great in the morning when you pray. Help me just get myself re-synced up with you, Lord. I know the world's going to try to grab my attention, but I just want you. And nothing else is more important than being with you because that's when I'll prosper the most. And in a busy world, it's easy to get distracted, isn't it? So verse 12 says, Now if Christ has preached that he's been raised from the dead... How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And there's whole denominations of Christians around the world that don't believe Jesus literally rose from the dead. They think it's just figurative. Well, again, like we're, we're in the camp that believes he did, that he rose, and that he's still alive today. In, in the new version of the body, again, I'm just going to give you a little background. Adam and Eve had perfect relationship with God, unhindered. They were naked and unashamed. Sin came in the world, humanity's here, Jesus comes, dies and is resurrected, and now when, when he comes back again, we're going to have what Adam and Eve had in the garden. He's going to restore that back. Right now, in this place that we live, we have Holy Spirit, but it's in part. It's called a down payment. You have in part what you will have in full later. So max out the part that you have, Right? That's the key to get us to understand the word and to motivate us, and it's the energy in our tank every day. So why would some preach that there is no resurrection of the dead? And I've quoted this to you before, but there's a really good movie called The Case for Christ uh, by Lee Strobel, and, and this is kind of the hinge point of the movie. Lee Strobel's wife becomes a Christian. He goes to work. He's a skeptical attorney. He knows one of his coworkers is a Christian, and he goes to the coworker and he says, hey, I need your help. My wife joined your cult. <laughs> Lee Strobel, who has now sold tens of millions of books about Jesus. <laughs> this is before he got saved. And the friend said, oh, that's easy. It's a great scene in the movie. The friend was just totally ready for this. He said, all you have to do is disprove the resurrection. The whole thing will be like a house of cards. It all comes tumbling down if Christ didn't rise from the dead. Now, I think that's an amazing answer. Not many people would know to say that. But this guy was the right man in the right place at the right time. Man, powerful. So don't ever neglect that the cross as powerful as it was, that he gave his life and died for us and became that sacrifice, that the resurrection is what solidified that, that equation. Because he defeated death. He came and died to defeat death by raising from the dead. And that's the promise that we all have now. Amen. Good. And this is where he goes. <laughs> if there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching's in vain, and your faith is in vain. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been well, it's like exactly the same verse, isn't it? Sorry. It's futile, and you're still in your sins. And there it is. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So as you're dealing with the swirl of politics and friends on Facebook who aren't so friendly anymore and you're, they're mad at you for things you said or relatives or however you get caught up in that swirl, it's really tough. Because we're not wired to like rejection, are we? So we want to be liked, but we also have to be people of conviction. So look, it's, 
part of the conviction that we have is that this life is not the end of the story. Amen. That we're going to spend eternity with the Lord. And not just sitting on clouds playing harps. Amen. We're actually going to have something to do. We don't get a lot of insight on that in the New Testament, but it's very clear that we're going to rule and reign with Christ for eternity. Priests and kings. So look at your person next to you and say, which one are you, a priest or a king? Yeah, the answer is both. Good answer. Glad you're awake. <laughs> Verse 20 in that same chapter says, but the truth is that Christ has been raised up. That's the truth. The first, I love this in the message, it says, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. <laughs> Raise your hand if that's you, because I'm leaving. That's not weakness. That's not weakness. That's strength of the power of resurrection. And then I got a flashback, because you know, as a worship leader early in my Christian walk, I, I came in as a musician, so I was always interested in the life of David. And when you study the Psalms, and there's so many amazing things about David in the Bible. But one of the scenes I never forgot is when he was on the run from Saul and he ends up at the cave of Adullam, right? And, uh, and that would be in 1 Samuel 22. It says, David escaped to the cave of Adullam. And all who, this is the message again, so the language is a little crude. David escaped to the cave of Adullam and all who were down on their luck came around, losers, vagrants, and misfits of all sorts, <laughs> right? So like, that's gonna be my new army. And that's a lot of how it was. That's who I was when I walked into the first church service. I was gone doing drugs, tried every program, nothing was working, and then the power of God hit. And, and then all of a sudden, every other thing I tried didn't work, this worked. And then I knew it was real, and nobody can deny that and, and couldn't ever convince me that it wasn't real because I never wanted to touch another drug again after whatever, how many years I was... I was just a mess. I should have been dead, really, literally. Should have been dead. So in one way, we are resurrected on this side if you live that kind of criminal lifestyle and that behavior. So every day I'm, I'm, I'm alive, it's like I'm playing with house money, they would have said in the world. You, are, you already got such a benefit. You should just be happy you're alive when you wake up in the morning. So if God could even use you to help other people, so much more the better. And instead of worrying about our reputation and I better not say this, I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. And yeah, I don't want you to hurt people's feelings, but I do want you to be true to, to the conviction of the word of God. So this is like a picture of the early church, right? We get, we get people that are coming in in Corinth who know their life's messed up and they're giving Jesus a try, but they don't have a lot of credentials in the natural. All the more to show how great God is, right? Because we don't need a lot of credentials to be a good Christian. We just need faith. Anybody got faith here? Yeah, that's how you came in. You see your calling, brethren, Paul said. Not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. It doesn't say not any, but it says not many. I was the not many. <laughs> but God chose the foolish things. Whew, thank you, Lord. That's me. But God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And look, that's what we have to remember now. There's got to always be a humility in our position as Christians, right? That's one of the things Holy Spirit will do for you, is humble you and, and tell you what you need to bring to the cross and, and show you where your counterfeit affections are and the things that you're putting too much, too much trust in and have really could become idols. And social media could become an idol. And, there's a million things today that could be, it could be a form of idolatry in our lives. And, and that's why I love that part of that song. It says, I'm sorry, you know, when I forgot that you're enough. And forgive me and, and let me have a fresh start again. And he always says yes to that prayer when we come with a, a humble heart. Yeah, so not many mighty. That, that would have been me. First Peter in, in uh, chapter 5, verse 5 says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yeah. All right? So that's, that's just each one of us right now. Lord, help me. Help me to recognize when pride is trying to sit on the throne of my heart. I want to dethrone that thing because that's not from you. And we know that's from the devil because that's the very thing that caused the devil to fall was his pride. We will humble ourselves, therefore, verse 6, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he will exalt you. And you notice that about Jesus. He was never in a hurry. 
He was never worried about making the right meetings or getting to the right place. He carried the presence of the Lord with him, and we could be the same way. We don't have to strive. We just have to operate under the power of the anointing of God. And it's amazing, right? Your gift makes room for you. When the anointing's on your life, you'll just be brought before certain people that God can connect you to. And, and there's a certain part of God testing us to say, is this about you for your reputation and your ego? Because if it is, you'll get what you wanted, but not, not what I want. It can't be about our reputation and our ego. It's got to be operating in the power of the kingdom in, in the earth. And, and pride just won't fit in there. It won't fit. Got to get rid of it. So we humble ourselves and then be, be sober-minded, he says in verse 8, and be watchful because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I'm sure we've all heard teachings on that one. But the point is, we don't always feel qualified to do the assignment the Lord is asking us to do, right? <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so what does that mean? We have to do it a little scared. We have to take a step of faith. Like Peter's getting out of the boat. And you remember my, uh, the, one of the teachers I really respected, he says, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. <laughs> yeah, see, you get it. And the example he gave is, suppose you're on a diving board and there's no water in the pool. And God is saying, I want you to jump off and go into that pool. And, and you say, no, fill it with water first. And God says, no, you step off, and as you're coming down, I'll fill it with the water on your way down. <laughs> yeah, pretty vivid analogy, huh? But that's how a lot of us feel on a pretty regular basis, that we're not fully qualified, but man, if it was dependent on that, none of us would make it, right? So then how has the kingdom been built for 2,000 years is on people that are not perfect, cracked, you know, vessels, just vessels that, that aren't perfect people, just clay jars, right? That's okay. All the better. Because then God gets the glory because people don't, people know, well, it couldn't have been you. <laughs> You're not that good. <laughs> but God is in us. <laughs> and then Paul, this is just one of those classic scenes when Paul's in Athens and, uh, you know, you could tell that his spirit has been disturbed because he's really, he's, he's tuned into the Lord, but he comes into this really secular culture of Athens and again, if you study it out, some people think when he was at the Areopagus, he was actually on trial. He wasn't just there to try to talk about the philosophy. They were concerned that he was practicing sedition. He was going to try to overthrow the government, which is a common theme throughout the New Testament for Paul. And Jesus, that was the charge against him, right? So to think that we shouldn't be involved with politics, I don't know how we got there. But we're supposed to be impacting the culture, right? So Paul just, I believe, on the fly, right? The Holy Spirit's working in him. He comes upon them, and he has to try to convince them that, that he's got really good news. And he did convince them eventually. But here, it says, when I, was, when I arrived in your city, I was fascinated with all the shrines that I came across. And I found one inscribed, to the God nobody knows. That's called getting a, a softball, right? Like when you're playing volleyball, and they just put it up there for you, and you just jump up, and it's like, man, if that's not the perfect setup, I'm going to introduce you to the God that you said you don't know. So they're like, oh, good, okay, that's a good idea, because that didn't even make sense to say. Well, well, what they're telling you if they have that shrine is that we know there's another one out there that we don't know, and we want to know who he is. So, man, Paul's the right person, isn't he, at the right time. I'm here to introduce you to this God so you can worship intelligently. He made the entire human race so that we could seek after him. And man, this just grips me, this verse. And not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. Yeah. Right? And that is such a picture of the world. And I remember early in my, when I got saved, uh, the Lord brought me back to all the different stages of my life. Because I, I was 25 when I got saved. So I had lived through junior high, high school, college, just not a godly lifestyle. And it was just like the people that I ended up getting attracted to were hurting people. Right. Several of the girls that I was with had alcoholic parents, right? Like, and I'm not trying to, again, cast shame on anybody, but just saying that just put such a, a destructive crack in the foundation of their life that we were just like that person that said, well, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Like, really? There's no better plan than that? Well, of course there is, but nobody told me. 
I hadn't been witness to. I didn't know any Christians. And you might hear Danny Silk testimony someday in some of the classes that we run. He said, I went to Bethel Church my whole life. I never met one married couple that was married more than 15 years. And I was now in this church where these people that were mentoring me were all 25, 30, 40 years. I didn't think anybody lasted that long. See, because he had to get a new understanding that there's a higher way to be a human being than to have a bottle in front of me or a frontal lobotomy. Wow, no. You're believing a lie. All right, so in every way, this is Paul again talking to these secular people in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. He's like, you don't really have to go back to your old ways anymore. In every way, you were enriched in Christ, in him, in all speech, in all knowledge. You're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end. And you could say, this is our prayer every morning when we wake up, is, Lord, I want you to reveal yourself to me today. I want you to show me how I should act in every situation, in every transaction I'm in. You're in I'm, you and I are enriched in him in, in all speech and all knowledge. Wow. It's good to remind yourself. <laughs> and then he says in chapter 2, my brothers and sisters, I didn't pose as an expert with all the answers. <laughs> I didn't pretend to explain the mystery of God with eloquent speech and human wisdom. I claim to know nothing with certainty other than the reality that Jesus is the anointed one, the liberating king who was crucified on our behalf. That's the cross. The sermon I preach were not delivered with the kind of persuasive elegance that some have come to expect, but they were effective because I relied on God's spirit to demonstrate God's power. That's a good prayer for us today, right? Look at somebody and say, God's spirit in you will demonstrate God's power through you. Yeah, amen. What a great thing. Next week, come back and give testimony next Sunday about what God did through you this week. It's this amazing privilege that we have. And he's not bragging because we know in other parts of the New Testament, they criticized his public speaking ability. They didn't think much of his presentation and said, it was a persuasive, elegant language that some have come to expect, but they were effective because it was a demonstration of God's power. That's what changes people's lives. If this were not so, your faith would be based on human wisdom and not the power of God. It's, it's another part of the genius of Jesus. He can reach the highest Einstein PhD or the person in the gutter who's just completely broken. He's, his reality is true to both of those and everything in between. And that takes a genius to do that. All right, so um, just kind of winding down at the end here, because, again, this is the message. And uh, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I know that some of the New Testament is written in more street language than the eloquent language. Uh, the, the book of Hebrews, for example, was written in a high, like more by somebody who would have had a high educational background. And then there's other times it's not. And I like the message because... When you're out in the world, they don't want a big, long explanation. When you're talking to somebody about God, you just got to get to the point. And they don't need a lot of flowery language. So he said, isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? That he chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. But it's in quotes, right? Because nobody is a nobody. <laughs> Thank you. I was waiting. I didn't think it was that complicated, but you got it. Good job. <laughs> Everybody's a somebody to God. But, you know, living in this part of the world, you know, there's a lot of people that are somebody, meaning famous, make a lot of money, live in a big house. So, okay, my job happens to be helping those people invest their money, right? So I get it. And, and good for them, because when they become Christians, they use the money to advance the kingdom. Hallelujah. Right? There are some. He said not many wise, but there, there are some that are. And praise God, they're coming in the kingdom too. So we can look at our own lives and remain humbled and say, God, it's just amazing that you took somebody out of a rock and roll band who, whose only goal was sin, you know, every night, and that you had put him in a church and, you know, that he would have people come into the church and he's helping them grow in their Christian walk. Wow, like that's a miracle that that would happen. But he does. He chooses the people that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses. He chooses the nobodies. 
to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. You could say that's Mother Teresa too. She won the Nobel Prize, eighth grade education, four foot 11, not gonna be on the cover of a fashion magazine. God used her mightily, oh, amazing. And then he says, that makes it quite clear that none of you can get away with blowing your own horn before God. <laughs> Everything that we have, the right thinking, the right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ, all right? Come on, let's stand. Thank you, Lord. Everything I have that's worth having is from you. <laughs> so, look, the cross is the part of our lives that we have to wrestle with. It's the part where the Lord is saying, I want you to do this. We were just at a wedding, and, and the, person, the, the, the husband in the, in the wedding said, I, I, I really felt prompted to call, but I, I didn't want to, and the Lord said, call. <laughs> and he said, I don't know if that's you telling me that, Lord. Second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, 10 days in a row while he's praying, call. And then on the 10th day, he said, if you don't call today, it's over. <laughs> All right? Some people need a fleece like that, right? But look, turned out to be an amazing thing that God was asking them to do, but there's that reluctance in our hearts. So part of the, just lifting your hands to say, Lord, I want to surrender my stubborn will. I want to surrender the image I have of myself that doesn't line up with the image that you have of me. I don't want to always think, oh no, I could never do that. No, because even in your yeah, that's a beautiful verse. The weakness of God is stronger than men. If God is working through a weak vessel, that's okay. Because it's his strength that pours through us. Amen? So that's what we admit right now with hands up. We're just saying, Lord, it's not my will. It's your will be done. It's not by my might or by my power. It's your spirit working through me. Thank you for giving me certain gifts. But those are never going to be enough without your power working through me. So, Lord, we just thank you for the cross. We thank you for taking our, our pain to the cross, our sin to the cross. All the, the rebellion that was represented by the human race was taken to that cross. You died a sinless offering on our behalf, but then you rose again and you brought the resurrection power into the earth through your Holy Spirit. By defeating death, we have the hope today of the resurrection. And we are not hopeless people, regardless of what the culture is doing. We will be lights for you. In our weakness, your strength is perfected through us, Lord. So we ask you to do that for us this week as we go forward. And if any of you have never accepted the Lord, you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior. I know there's people watching that might never even have been on this program before, our, our church service before. It's as easy as asking, okay? Ask and you will find. Seek. Knock. The door will be open to you. The Lord's knocking. Are you willing to open up the door of your heart? And as my wife and I have said many times, what do you have to lose? The bottle in front of you or the frontal lobotomy? I mean, really, like, that's where we were at. We were both so down and out that we knew that we had to try something to save our lives. And we never made a better decision than just saying that simple prayer of asking Jesus to come into our heart. So if that's you, part of what you have to do is just receive the love of God, the unconditional love of God. And don't try to figure it out, because none of us deserved it, okay? It says in the Bible, man, would you die for somebody? Maybe you might die for somebody if you really love them, but for a total stranger or your enemy, you, know, you wouldn't die. He died even when we were still enemies of his on our behalf because he loved us. So we'll just say a prayer out loud together, okay, church? And, and you can repeat after us if you're doing this for the first time. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day. I heard good news today that he can free me from my sin, but I have to first repent and ask for forgiveness. So I do, Lord. I repent and ask you for forgiveness. I'm sorry I offended you with the way I live my life. And I don't fully understand how you could forgive me. But by faith, I receive it. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Would you come into my life 
and open my eyes to your truth. Fill me with your spirit to empower me to serve you the rest of this life and for eternity. I accept you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. All right, church, come on, let's pray for those people right now. If anybody said that prayer for the first time, there's going to be a, a war for their soul, right? We know the enemy's going to try to steal that seed, but we say no, that that seed falls on good ground. If anybody here said that prayer for the first time and, and you want to take a step forward, do that. Come down to this altar right here and help us rejoice with you because the Bible says there's a party going on in heaven every time one person turns from sin. And we'd like a party going on here. We could use a party, couldn't we, church? And you just take that walk. If you came with somebody, they'll come up here with you. And just let us know that somebody's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life today. No church? Okay. Hopefully it's somebody at home. Start bringing unbelievers to church. Amen? Bribe them. Tell them you'll take them out for coffee. I don't know. Do what you got to do to get them here. And then it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that will get them saved. Amen? We love you, church. Thank you for being so faithful and coming out. It didn't even snow. Look at this. It's amazing, right? So you didn't even take a chance. Have an awesome day. We are going to stay and pray. If anybody needs prayer, we're going to do the social distancing piece, but we don't want to let you leave without getting a chance to pray for you if you need prayer today. Have an awesome day. We love you.